welcome everyone who is here and watching online. Thank you for joining us. We want to uh, add to this service today a encouragement to everyone that you would go out of your way to celebrate graduates in your life this year as they're, it's, it's just been an off year. It's been a different year. And so we want to just encourage them. We want to celebrate them. And I hope that you'll use this video to just kind of know where they're heading and that you could be in prayer for them. And for those of you who are done, you have finished the race, you are moving forward, high school is behind you, and you have everything to look forward to. Uh, congratulations. Job well done. And we look forward with you. We want you to know that as you move forward, we want to come alongside you. We want to encourage you and we want to be praying for you. Please know that you're always welcome here, uh, that this is your home, and we look forward to seeing you whenever we have the opportunity. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to study your word, to dive into this, and just um, come to a place where we can just ask you an honest question that is pure in motive. And God, I pray that you bring us to that place you would prepare our hearts as we study this passage. And God, we pray for our graduates, that as they go from here, that you would be leading them, that they would be guided by your Holy Spirit, and you would just be uh, doing profound works through them for the sake of your kingdom, Lord. We pray for them. We pray for your guidance over them, and that they would just be people of God for your kingdom. Amen. All right, well... Ten years ago, and about one month, I myself graduated, and ten years ago, one week and one day ago, I had the opportunity to play in the 27th annual Montana All-Star football game, and I, it was a privilege for me. I was very excited to go and to do that, and to be able to play one last game with a few of my teammates. There were five of us from Ekalaka that made it into that game, and so we were excited for the week, and we were excited to get to finally play alongside some of the people that we have so diligently prepared to stop. And we were just grateful that they were now on our team instead of on the other side. It was a special week, and honestly, it, it finished really well. Uh, one of our Ekalaka boys, who uh, is probably the greatest athlete I have ever played any sport with, um, he, he had a showing of a night where um, without him, I don't know that we would have won. We ended up winning 42 to 34 but he had a kick uh, return for a touchdown, he had a punt return for a touchdown, and he had about a 35-yard rushing touchdown. So of our 42 points, he had half of them. So it was kind of a good deal for us. But one of the things that I remember in that week as I think back to it, there's, there's many positive memories, there's many things that I enjoyed and am grateful for, but one of the things I'm a little bit more concerned about as I look back from this point, and that is that over the course of the week, we got to meet, you know, several guys from different schools, and we got to learn about their towns, and we got to learn about some of their football traditions. One of the traditions I was actually greatly excited by, I thought it was a great idea, I'd never thought of it before, and what had happened was the coaches had finished giving their pregame speech on Saturday, right before the game, and one of the guys from our rival school said, everybody take a knee, and he led us in the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, wow, this is such a cool thing. Well, I happened to be sitting next to Alex, who also was from that same school. And after we were done, I looked at Alex, and I said, man, how often do you guys do this? And he said, we, we do this before every game. And I just thought, this is the greatest thing ever. But as I reflect on that night, and I think about uh, what had transpired in that moment, what we did is we prayed the Lord's Prayer, not in the sense that we were actually praying, but rather in the sense to pump ourselves up. As soon as we were done, we were jumping around, we were clapping as if somehow we had just solidified the victory. And we used the Lord's Prayer in a very hypocritical and self-centered way that had nothing to do with God and everything to do with us. And I think back on that. And I wonder, did any one of us in that room have any understanding of the purpose of the Lord's Prayer? Did we in any way pursue God or come into conversation with God? Or was it entirely about us? Or maybe it was 50-50. Maybe 50% 50 of what we were doing was in prayer to God and the other 50% was about us. And I still have to ask the question, 
Is that pure motive? Is that where our heart is supposed to be? So today, as I've been thinking through this, I had been asked to preach and to pick a passage, and I decided maybe we should talk about the Lord's Prayer. So today we're in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 15. And one of the things that I want to note as we get into this is over the past several years, I've noticed a trend. And the trend is that as I describe that moment being hypocritical and self-centered, I think that much of our prayer lives could actually be described that way. We have a tendency to focus on self, and we have a tendency to ask for what we want instead of what God may want. So, we're in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. It says, and when you pray, this is Jesus teaching, he's in the middle of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is his longest discourse, and he shifts topics and is now teaching on prayer. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. As we look at this, Jesus is starting us out with a warning. He's not really telling us how to pray yet, but rather he's saying, before we even get into prayer, understand that there are people that are only doing this for attention. And whether they recognize it in their heart or not, that is the reality of their situation. That they love to be seen by other people, that they feel joyous feelings when they have the attention of those around them. And so maybe it's out on the street corners, maybe it's on a, on a popular street in the park or just in the eye of the general public, but the point is that they have the attention of those around them and that is what they are after. They are not after God and they are not after conversation with him. And I want to be clear here, public prayer is not um, something that we should avoid. Rather, scripture actually teaches us to engage in corporate prayer. But the issue here is that it is the motive behind the prayer. The motive is not pure. The motive is self-centered and self-focused. Then we come to verse 6, and he says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The idea of going into your room to pray is not just going into your house, sitting on the couch, and praying to God, but rather it's finding the innermost room of your house where no one is likely to find you, where no one's going to walk in and see you, where it is just between you and the Lord, and recognizing that when we do that, we are actually allowing ourselves to remove temptation, that we wouldn't try to pray prayers that are insightful and, and wise so that those around us would think that we know how to pray well, that we wouldn't try to give these beautiful prayers, but rather that we would just seek the very face of God. And what we see is that when we seek God in secret, he will reward us. And the reason for this is God is just as present in your closet as he is before the masses. He is just as present. Then we come to verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. The verb here, when it's talking about heap up empty prayers or empty phrases, literally means repetitions of meaningless syllables. Repetitions of meaningless syllables. And this is the danger of doing a prayer that we write down and praying over it every day, is that we can lose sight of the purpose of prayer, of that prayer. We can lose sight of uh, the feeling and the reasoning for why we were praying that way in the first place. And when I think of this, I actually think of 10 years ago when I sat down next to a group of guys and we prayed meaningless syllables as far as God is concerned because our thoughts and our motives were not towards him, they were towards ourselves. And to think that we could do that every week before a game to inspire self instead of to seek God is not a pure motive. Something that I've noticed in the past several years is that there are a great number of people who struggle to pray. They struggle to pray on their own, they struggle to pray with each other, they struggle to pray in front of others. 
And these are people who have accepted Christ into their life, who are walking in relationship with him. They're coming to church. They're being in fellowship with other believers. And yet their prayer life is dry and stale. I mean, we're talking about husbands who struggle to pray in front of their family members. Wives who struggle to pray in front of their kids or their husbands. We're talking about students who are afraid to pray in front of their friends or in front of their small groups. We're talking about single individuals who maybe don't have the opportunity to pray in front of people or with people as often, and they clench up whenever they are around people, and the thought of praying in front of them is on their mind. We're talking about older adults who have never felt like they've grasped prayer in a way where they should be praying in front of or leading prayer in any way. I believe that many of us struggle with everything that Jesus teaches in these first few verses here. And if we were to walk through it and talk about it, it would say we struggle with wanting to have the right words. We struggle with wanting to pray beautiful phrases that are articulated just very wonderfully and they just sound like a prayer that we could say over and over again because they're just magical in their words. We want to be bold and confident in our prayers. We want a sense of insight and wisdom when we pray. It's my personal belief that for many of us, we pray this way not just because we believe it will draw us into deeper communion with God, but also because then we will be validated by others. We will feel comfortable and confident leading others in prayer. And so to me, there's this wrestling that's going on inside where our motives need to be focused on God and God alone, and we need to learn to get rid of ourself. Because here's the reality of what we see of Jesus' teaching in these first few verses the reality is, He doesn't care. He doesn't care if you are new to prayer. He doesn't care if you start to stumble over your words and you don't know what to say. He doesn't care if you string together these beautiful and articulate phrases. He doesn't care if you sound wise or insightful. He doesn't care if you impress those around you. He does not care about these things. He cares if your motives are pure. He cares that you are seeking deep connection and intimacy with him. He cares that you would stop and seek him even if you don't know what to say and you start to stumble over your words, that you would spend time in prayer with him. And my question for us this morning is, are you willing to pray with abandonment of temptation? Are you willing to go and lock yourself in your closet on a regular basis where it's just you and God, where you can spend time in prayer and grow in that prayer life? where you can have a focus and a practice of it only being on him, not being distracted by those around you or anything else around you. To place yourself before him with the only motive being him. To seek his face. God wants us to know him both intimately and personally. To have the type of communion with him that energizes and propels every step that we take. That we would be so captivated by him in our conversation through prayer that we wouldn't be able to get enough. That even if my knees grow sore and my back gets stiff, that I would continue in prayer because that type of deep communion and connection with God is better than anything else that this life will ever present and recognizing that that type of communion is critical to our growth and maturing as believers. I believe for us to seek God in this way, there's two keys that we need to pay attention to. The first one is that we have to understand that it's all about God. It is all about God. And secondly, naturally, it's not about you. It is not about you. It is not about me. It is all about God. In in chapter 3 of the book of John, we see where uh, John the Baptist has his disciples come up to him. And they're concerned about something that's happening. Jesus and his disciples are starting to baptize more people, and they're becoming more popular. 
And as they become more popular, John the Baptist and his disciples naturally become less popular, and they're concerned about this. So they come to John, and in chapter 3, verse 30, John looks at them straight in the face, and he says, He must increase, and I must decrease. He had the attitude and the motive that it is all about God. It cannot be about me. It has to be about him. Our call is to die to self and to live for him. So as we look at what it means to pray, to come into conversation with God, let us just put the games aside. Let us lay down our pride and let us enter in to communion with God with pure motives, that we just want to seek him. If you look at Luke chapter 11, verse 1, we find another place where Jesus teaches on the Lord's Prayer. And it's a little bit different of a situation where the disciples actually come to Jesus and ask a question of him. So he's not in the middle of giving a sermon but rather is asked a question and then moves to answer it by teaching the Lord's Prayer. In, in Luke 1, or 11, 1, we see the question. It says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, would you just, would you, would you teach us how to pray? How to be in communion with God? how to be in conversation with God, the high king of heaven. What does that look like? Have you ever stopped and considered Jesus' prayer life? Have you ever noticed that in three years of ministry, the Bible uses words like he removed himself to go pray so many times that I can probably naturally assume for myself and maybe for others in this room that in three years of ministry, Jesus may well have spent more time in prayer than I have in my life. And the disciples are impacted by this in a deep and profound way to the point where they're done playing games, they're done trying to have a show for others, they're done trying to pretend like they have it all together, like they know what they're doing, and they stop and they say, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Here at Grace Church, we have been actively working to develop a culture of prayer. Tim has been uh, great bringing this in to us and uh, leading us in this. And it is actually one of our core values. It's one of our core values. It's number five, that we believe that prayer is essential to the life and ministry of the church. This is something that we have been pursuing as a church for a long time, and now we're actively pursuing this culture of prayer. So my prayer for us in this pursuit of a culture of prayer is that we would take it seriously, is that we would stop, that we would be humble in spirit and simply seek out the high king of heaven and just stop and say, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And so we come to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, and Jesus does. He gives us an outline. He gives us a pattern of prayer for us to be praying. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. He starts with our Father. What you're going to notice as we walk through this is all the way through is it's never I or me. It's always us and our. It's always the body collectively. We never catch him praying about self. Rather, it is about the church. It is about the body. But more than that, what we see is our Father. The focus is on him immediately. He is the first priority, and so we start with him. And that word, Father, if we were to translate it correctly to English, Father is not the appropriate word. The appropriate word is actually Daddy. Because it's the word Abba, and it translates best to our English word, Daddy, which really does two things for us. It immediately brings us to a place that is more intimate, and it also helps us to be a little bit more humble. Because we can say, our, our Father, how dare you? But when you say Daddy, that's a term of endearment. That's a, that's a term of personal connection. That's a term that's used when someone understands having a loving Father. And we are to understand God as the most loving Father. So we see our Father in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. And hallowed be your name simply means may your name remain holy. Not in the sense that God's holiness fluctuates, but rather that we are sinful people and we perceive God in different lights. Sometimes in our sin, we look to God and we say, God, how could you do this to me? How could you have allowed this to happen? And us not seeing the full picture, we try to justify and rationalize and argue with God from our perspective. When God sees the whole picture, he knows what's going on. And so to say, hallowed be your name, is really to say, God, I, I want to celebrate who you are. I want to celebrate that you are perfect in holiness, that you are perfect in righteousness. And what we see here is this idea of focusing on God, continuing, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are celebrating him and his person. For the last several weeks in youth group, we've been covering the topic of prayer. And our goal has been to supply students with tools on their tool belt that they could enter into prayer with, that they could use in their prayer life. And so one of the things we've been doing is praying scripture back to God. So for five consecutive weeks, we focused on hallowed be your name. May your name remain holy. And how we did that is we studied 15 attributes of God. This is the doctrine of who God is. And we found those verses and we used those verses to pray back to God. So we would find verses on his justice and we would say, God, thank you for being so just. We would find verses on his mercy, and we would say, God, thank you for your mercy and for your kindness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son to come and die on the cross for my sin. And we would celebrate God through that prayer of scripture back to him. And I believe that five weeks of doing that is only enough to introduce us to what it means to stop and say, hallowed be your name. And so in the fall, we're going to revisit it. And we're going to come back to it. And we're going to talk about it again. And we're going to pray over and over in new ways, in different ways. May your name remain holy. Verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In its most simplistic understanding of this verse, what we find is that it's asking that God would rule here on earth as he currently rules in heaven that everything here would be completely and totally subject to his reign. And it looks forward to the time when God will reign on earth, but also recognizes that he's currently in heaven. And so what it's doing when it says, your will be done, okay, it starts with your kingdom come, and then your will be done. Your will be done is where we come into the story a little bit, because the reason that the Holy Spirit has been given to us is that Christ lives in our hearts. And the purpose of our praying in this way is to align our hearts with God, to say, God, I want to be in step with your will, in step with your plan. Help me to do that. And for us to be in step with his plan means that we would bring the kingdom here, that we would go out and we would share the gospel, that we would tell others about the love of Christ, that we would be diligent workers of the kingdom of heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Concerning our pattern of prayer here, what we find in verse 9 is that we're celebrating God. We're celebrating the person of who he is. Then in verse 10, what we find is that we are aligning our heart, we're aligning our uh, purposes with his. And we're not trying to bring his purposes to ours, but rather we're trying to surrender ourselves and take on his purposes, his mission. And then we come to verse 11, and we see a little bit of a shift in direction. So the first two verses are focused on God, because he's the first priority. And now it's focused on the body. So we're praying to God about the church. Give us this day our daily bread. We should have a daily reliance on God for our essential needs. Now, for someone in Africa, that means something a little bit different than someone in America. That has a totally different meaning. Because here, we have so much wealth and prosperity, we don't even understand what that means. In all reality, we really don't understand what that means. 
And so I think we need to kind of flip this on its head a little bit to help us understand this a little bit better and ask the question, do we understand that everything we own belongs to God? Do we understand that everything we have, everything we own, everything we use, everything we touch belongs to God? It is his. And because it is his, do we recognize that he has the authority and the ability to take it away at any moment's time? Do you thank God for the resources he has given you? Do you understand that they are his and they are not yours? Do you understand that he has provided those to you? And he does so on a daily basis. In this verse, as far as our pattern of prayer goes, we're asking for provision. We're understanding that everything comes from him. Then we go to verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, forgive us our debts means to forgive us our sins, right? So for us to actually seek forgiveness, according to this verse, we have to be willing to forgive others. It says, forgive us our debts as we also forgive others, as we forgive our debtors. And I believe that there's a practical and simple reason for this. We're going to get into it just a little bit because in verses 14 and 15, we see that he confirms this line of thinking. But my thought on it is this, that if we have an accurate understanding of what Jesus has done for us, the amount of sin and the amount of burden that he has lifted off of our shoulders over the course of our life, if we understand that he, our, our sin was so heavy that he had to come die on the cross, that he had to suffer, that he had to be humiliated for our sake. And yet in the moment of being crucified, he can look at those who nailed him to the cross and forgive them. In the moment, not years later. He can in the moment forgive them of their sin. Then why can't we forgive our neighbor? Because I can assure you of this, there is nothing your neighbor could possibly do to you that you have not done to God. When we compare what God has forgiven us and the measures of what he has done to forgive us in, the, in that way, to not have any hidden animosity, to not be judging us silently, but to be free entirely from the burden of sin, I, th I think anything that our neighbor could do, no matter how deep it hurt in the moment, is able to be forgiven. So let's skip down to verses 14 and 15 because as I mentioned, they confirm what we're talking about here. It says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So in short, why, why is it that God won't forgive us if we won't forgive others? And I, I believe from a biblical standpoint, it, it's really... Two reasons. One, because we are denying the common ground that we have with other people, with other believers. And that common ground is that we are all sinners. And that we all have the same opportunity to seek Christ, to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. To enter into relationship with God and to be forgiven. Jesus died for all not just for you, not just for me. And he paid the price for all. And what we see in Jesus and the essence of the entire gospel is that he has paid for it all. So it's not just for you, it's not just for me, but any who should enter into relationship with him. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. Let's, let's be really clear on this. God's reasoning for forgiving us is not because we were so good to forgive our neighbor. It is not because we were good enough to make the cut. You cannot be good enough. It is out of God's perfect mercy that we can receive forgiveness. And as a Christian... We are called to grow and mature in our relationship with Christ, to seek him daily. And that comes back to the he must increase and I must decrease. 
I have to learn to die to self because Jesus was able to forgive in the moment of the sin that was done to him on the cross. And we are called to be more like him. And when we do not forgive our neighbor, we're showing a lack of oneness. We're showing a lack of identity. We're showing a lack of maturity in our faith and in our relationship with Christ. We are to forgive others because we have common ground with them as sinners. We are to forgive others because we are called to be like Christ, and Christ forgives. So as we look at these verses, what we find in our pattern of prayer is that we need to seek forgiveness and we need to give forgiveness. Then we're going to go back to verse 13, the end of the Lord's Prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation is don't allow me is is not the plea of don't allow me to be tempted, but rather it is when temptation comes, allow me to remain faithful. Allow me to choose you instead of sin. And then deliver us from evil is the same plea, but it's stated in a more positive way. The reality is that we know temptation is coming. We know that it is ahead of us, that we will be challenged, that we will have obstacles that we need to overcome, and that God uses that to help us grow and mature as believers. He uses that to prove us as his children. I want you to think about it this way. When you face adversity in life, versus times of ease, okay? On one column, you have adversity. The other column, you have everything's going right. You have a natural default to do one of two things. Your natural default in any situation is to turn to God, to celebrate him, and to grow mature. Or it is to turn from God, to stumble into sin, or perhaps to engage sin further. It's one or the other. And when you grow and mature the most, does it come in the time of ease when everything is going your way? Or does it come in the time of adversity when God forces you into situations that force you to mature and to grow and to become stronger in your faith? Are you going to turn towards God in that moment or are you going to turn towards the world? So as we study this passage from beginning to end, we find this pattern. Learning to pray is not merely learning to repeat and memorize the Lord's Prayer. While there is um, room for that, while we should also do that, I believe, that's not the call of the Lord's Prayer. That's not the purpose of the Lord's Prayer. The purpose is to act as a pattern for us to follow and for us to apply to our own life. And that pattern keeps our eyes focused on God. It keeps us focused on living according to his will. It keeps us focused on living in light of forgiveness, in relying on him in all that we do. And in all of that, it also teaches us how to greater love one another. And so I have to admit, this pattern is not something that I was the first to identify. There are many who have identified this. But Pastor Tim actually one year ago today preached on the Lord's Prayer. And he gave us this pattern. He said basically that the the Lord's Prayer is broken into two different sections. And the first one is praying to the Father about the Father. Start by celebrating his person. Then embrace his purpose. Then the second portion is, talk to the Father about the family. Ask for provision. Ask for pardon. Ask for protection. We're reminded in Timothy Keller's book that he titled Prayer, which I do encourage everyone to read. I'm going through it currently, and it is uh, challenging to my prayer life, and it is encouraging to my prayer life. But in that book, he talks about Martin Luther just a little bit. And Martin Luther was known for the amount of time he spent on his knees. There are many who would say he spent two to three hours every day praying to God. And Martin Luther tells us that he would pray the Lord's Prayer twice daily. And he never once prayed it the same way twice. 
He never once prayed it the same way twice. His understanding of how to praise and celebrate God in his holiness grew and changed and adapted. Different situations allowed him to pray into learning God's will in a new light, seeing a new direction that was coming. He, see, he, he saw God's provision coming in a new way, and he recognized new ways that he needed God's provision. And he would ask for pardon of sins of old and new ones that he had identified, that the Holy Spirit had revealed to him. And then he would ask for protection in new and increasing measures as he continued to battle against um, a lot of adversity. And so as we look at this, I want to encourage everyone who's in the room and watching online that we would start looking at this prayer and using it as a pattern daily. That we would use it to come before the presence of God and enter into deeper communion and conversation with him with our sole motive and intent being that we are focused on him and we're focused on his will and that he would drive us forward, that he would propel us forward according to his purposes and that we would learn to live in the light rather than hiding in the darkness. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we lift up and celebrate your mercy and grace today. For if your mercy and grace were any less than perfect, we would not be here. So God, we praise you and we seek you with our lives. God, help us to be in step with you, to see those who are hurting, to attend to them, to pray for them. God, help us to be people of prayer, people who turn to you first, who are seeking your will and your heart. Provide for us a desire for you, a desire to be captivated by you. God, you are the greatest need and our greatest treasure. Help us to desire you as such. Forgive us, Lord, as we are a sinful people. Help us to turn from our sin and help us to turn towards you. Protect us, Lord. Protect us from giving into temptation. Protect us from the ways of the world and help us to remain faithful to you in each and every moment. Amen.